really the goal, I think, is just to give parents and families tips on like how to get along better, good education, like all the good things that we talked about before. So where should we start, guys? Do you guys have a specific topic you guys want to start tackling first? Daniel, what do you think? Where do you want to go? Well, it's interesting. I, like both of you, have been getting a lot of calls, way more than we ordinarily get from parents who are wondering, how do we be great teachers? And my advice is, focus on being a great parent. Your kids are going to have many teachers. They've had many and will have many more teachers in their lifetime. Even though parents are thrown into the role as teacher right now, kids, more than ever, need great parents. And as long as parents can really focus on the things that they're so good at, caring about their children, loving them, being attuned to their needs, and putting the quality of their relationship ahead of other priorities, like, frankly, school. Kids are gonna be fine, long as they have parents they love and trust, and, and parents are gonna be fine too, long as they realize then they don't have to be the world's best teachers right now. They just have to keep being what they are, which is the world's best parent. And as long as you're that, kids are gonna be strong and resilient and they're gonna rebound from these difficult times. And parents need to take care of themselves too. A parent is best equipped to help a child when they themselves are calm and feeling comfortable and for parents to really look after themselves and realize that when they're taking good care of themselves, they're taking good care of their kids. Absolutely. Donna, what do you think? I love some of your practical tips about the things that you can teach your kids around the house. Yeah, I mean, I love what you're saying, Daniel, because I really think it is important that parents have self-compassion right now and really practice that. What that really means is to, it's okay. It doesn't have to be this perfect scenario. And I also think that teaching children this, this as well, you know, how to be self-compassionate to yourself as a child. And, you know, look, the bottom line is, is kids are out of school. States are closing schools. And so parents do have to come into this role in some way. But I do think it's important. I remember when I first started out as a young teacher, I had the schedule perfectly set. And I remember that a lot of the times I had to learn how to be flexible within that schedule. And so I think it's really important for parents who are going to start homeschooling, whether it be, um, you know, if a school sends out the schedule or if another school doesn't and the parents are more kind of dealing with that, set a schedule, a routine, but know that inside that schedule that you can be flexible. That if you guys are going to start maybe with um, math, a math assignment and a kid doesn't want to do that, even though the schedule's on there, say, okay, get curious. So, okay, kid, what would you prefer to do right now if we shifted math later how about what would you prefer to do? Tell me what you feel like learning or do you just need to go get out these, this energy and go outside and play for a little bit? So I think once you get into that homeschooling pseudo schedule that we all have to kind of do at some point, um, be flexible. That's what I would say, be really, really flexible. Oh, I agree so much and flexibility. And I also love Donna, your emphasis on activity and exercise any way you can get it. We all know that lots of um, physical exercise promotes brain development, promotes learning, promotes uh, positive feelings and, and is the, the great best medicine of all. And so anything we can do to help kids get exercise always, but especially now is so critically important. Yeah, no, I think that um, I've got two boys who are 11 and 12, and they are sports all the time, every day, 24-7. And so for them to not be able to play their sports and be active like they usually are, which is most kids because they want to be active, um, it's very difficult. And so what we do as a family, building in that kind of new normal routine is every day there's some kind of physical activity. And for us, it's normally after my husband is done with his work when the market closes and we'll go on either a bike ride or a walk or 
they'll go out in the backyard and they'll hit some balls or um, play basketball. But I think it's really important to, to build that in every day, just like Daniel was saying earlier. Um, and the mindfulness for us is huge because before um, this pandemic happened, we had been practicing mindfulness as a family via prayer um, mm -hmm. and just um, some kinds of meditation, but it was more mindfulness. And, th and then when we started really getting into this pandemic, I said, you know, let, let's, let's start some meditation. And we use this one app and there are so many apps out there, but there's this one app called Stop, Breathe, Think, which we love because what you can do is you log into it and it asks you a series of questions about how you're feeling. And that's again, just being super curious and figuring out where the kid is coming from. And so if a kid is feeling down or if they are actually feeling really good that day, you can focus on gratitude or you could focus on other things. But we practice that every day. And um, there are times where it doesn't fit into that morning routine, but when there's some kind of chaos that's beginning to happen, I pull them back and I say, well, I think we should probably do some of our meditation. And so, and they get into it and it does make them feel better. And so, I mean, we just know from research that it's, um, it reduces stress and anxiety and so for us, it has been working and I would recommend it to parents out there. And also for yourself as a parent, I find it really helpful for me to kind of decompress as well. You know, Donna, uh, I love everything you're saying. I'm a big fan of mindfulness as well. Um, the, last week I had a great opportunity to listen to you and Judy talk about mindfulness. And Judy, you described a walking mindfulness, which I thought, was really great for the kids who need to get up and move. I, could you describe that again for us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think uh, it's probably something that I need as well because I'm not really good at just sitting and doing a mindfulness. I need to come to your house, Donna, obviously, and learn from you. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I, like the most I can sit is maybe 10 minutes, but I realized, um, and this was like groundbreaking for me when I realized we could do this, is that mindfulness activities can be moving, moving mindfulness. It can be uh, walking and just noticing what's around you and uh, really paying attention to what's around you. Because I remember there was this hike that I did when I used to live near Santa Monica. There was this hike that I did like a thousand times. And, you know, but half the time you got like your earbuds in your ear, you're like with your friends, you're talking, you're distracted. Um, and, and then I did the hike all by myself, like just being mindful once. And it was insane. Like there were just like trees I never noticed were there, signs that I not never noticed like forks in the road. I just didn't even know that there was an alternate route. I just kept going the same route every day. And so it really um, mindfulness is anything that brings your attention to the present moment. And you can certainly be doing walking mindfulness, running mindfulness, hiking mindfulness, uh, mindful eating, mindful cooking. And actually right now in the pandemic, apparently there's been this huge like baking um, and cooking. Like just people are like, that's like a way to control what's going on, I think, you know? Um, and even that is a form of mindfulness. I mean, if you really have ever baked, it's so much more scientific than even cooking. So you have to kind of pay attention, like one teaspoon this, like it's very precise. And so it becomes a mindfulness activity for a lot of people. So I even think things like that, mindful gardening, like whatever you want to do with your family members and with your kids, but teaching them and using that as an opportunity for mindfulness and turning their attention to the present moment. And when you find that your kids are feeling anxious, um, just saying, okay, well, don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's go garden together and let's just focus on this for a while. Like that is kind of a teaching moment, I think, in and of itself. It sure is. And what a great way to rethink education, to think about education as just that, about things we do together, cooking, gardening. I, a friend of mine and his two children are completely painting the inside of their house and the kids are loving it. They're, they're doing a total in, indoor restora, uh, restoration of their house. And I think, I think we're going to see a lot of amazing things come out of this difficult time. New things learned, new skills, and a new, new way of understanding life and living and learning. And Judy, you had described how with one of your um, clients, a, a teenager, when you took him on a walk, you sort of 
walk through what a mindful walk is and had them be silent, but pay attention to what was going on around them. And I thought that was a really beautiful way to approach work, a therapeutic work with a teenager. And just to back up, the mindful meditations that we do are not 20 minutes long. So I don't want to freak <laughs> out. They're between five and 10 minutes when it's okay. kid. So that's, that's, that's good for them because I don't, you know, it's, it's not that long, but I love what you said about the baking mindfulness, because to me, that is so my, you do have to be mindful. You have to measure everything out precisely. So that's actually really cool. I love that. I love that. And I feel like a couple of other really important life skills right now to learn as kids um, is news literacy and financial literacy. So Donna, maybe we can talk a little bit about the news literacy being that your, your background is a reporter. I mean, I just feel like some of these kids are just like going down a crazy rabbit hole with like looking at social media posts, half of which are like completely incorrect and, you know, scaring themselves about the coronavirus and uh, maybe not even talking about it, but then you just notice that they're on edge, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think it's so important and I think it goes to the whole mental health um, situation as well. And I mean, we know from studies what social media is doing to our children, we know. And so we know access to all this media as well. And so for me, I really think, you know, if your kid has a phone, um, you know, it's harder to manage with a teenager for sure. But I think that if your teen's going to be looking at the phone a lot and, and monitoring numbers and deaths and, you know, to just be open to really have those conversations and to really be open about that literacy, you know, what's the source? A lot of the families I'm talking with and working with, they come up with a plan every day, but then they're flexible within it. They create a plan for the day. They have a time frame but they're also willing to make adjustments and also building in break times and exercise time and not feeling like everything has to get done in a very specific time frame. Being very patient with one another, being patient with kids is so critically important now. And being patient with learning virtually or online, which younger kids in particular are having a really difficult time with it. I'm hearing a lot from the parents of kids between the ages of four, five, and six, all the way up to 12 and 13. It's really hard, the learning online. The slightly older kids seem to be making the transition a little bit more easily. And so getting comfortable with the fact that it might not be working and it might be okay to step away from the online or virtual learning. If you're seeing your child's agitated, uncomfortable, not enjoying it, if you feel that the harmony of your home is being disrupted by what it is you're expected to be doing. It's the harmony at home that's most critical for everybody, especially children. But this question is for you, Daniel, as somebody who specializes in working with individuals with developmental needs, how would you work with somebody who has autism and the fact that they usually have sensory difficulties that makes it hard for them to stay in one place for a really long time without nothing to do? Sure. All of us, kids in particular, need a routine. Children with autism have a, a very significant need for routine, and it's been disrupted. Mm -hmm. And for individuals with autism, this is an especially challenging time because all of the normal things that occur in their life are not occurring. The places they go, the people they see, the things they do. And so this is a really good time for us to really step back from a lot of the normal requirements that we make, really focus on quality of life, um, uh, being attuned and sensitive to how all children are feeling, but especially children who are really deeply impacted by the disruption to schedules, like young people, children, teens, young adults with autism. But it's also a great time for all kids, Kids with autism, I have found, are enormously creative. And maybe this is a great time just for them to do the things they love, drawing and painting and building things and making things and allowing them to spend more time doing the arts and creative things and the crafts and not worry so much 
about the specific academic objectives right now. Kids are going to be fine. Listen, lots of things happen to people throughout their lifetime. Long as people feel loved and supported and cared for, they tend to be resilient. They tend to do well in the long haul. And so it's really one of the big priorities, I think, right now for all, all people, adults in particular, parents in particular, with regard to how we manage these times in view of the fact that we're spending a lot more time with kids and the things that we do to help them feel safe and happy and comfortable and realize they're going to be fine. Um, I have a couple more questions that I would love to get to. Um, one of the questions next is, um, as, <laughs> as we are co-parenting, it is so difficult. I have not seen my child in over two weeks and they are at my ex-spouse's house, but yet I still want to be able to have some connection with my kids. And I feel like I'm getting more and more distant from them every day. Even if we are having FaceTime calls, what should I do? Donna, I know that you talked a lot about co-parenting, especially during this crisis. What do you think about that? I think you just had a podcast episode about this exact topic. I did. I, it's, it's really, really hard for co-parents at this point right now. And if one child is sheltering in place at one of um, at the exes and that's, that's difficult. I mean, that is really difficult. So I get that you're doing FaceTime as much zoom as you can. There might even be ways if the other co-parent is up for it, you know, for like a, a drive by, um, you know, you see a lot of these kids now who are celebrating birthday parties and their friends are driving by with their parents to just say, you know, happy Aww, birthday. That's so, so cute. It is. It's super sweet. So maybe, maybe just to get that, that FaceTime, real FaceTime, even if it's, you know, in the street, um, if you can't be next to your child, but you know, I, I this is just a really hard time as a co-parent and trying to find ways, ask again, I think you should ask your kid, you know, mm -hmm. how could, how could we be together more? What would you, what would it look like for you? I mean, should we talk on the phone before you go to bed at night? Sh can I read a story to you before you go to bed at night? Um, ask the child what, what they might think uh, would be helpful for them. But I feel your pain as a co-parent. I understand, you know, I don't understand because I'm not in that situation, but I empathize. And again, just try to be really compassionate to yourself and know that this is going to end. It's not going to be forever. Um, so um, there's one last question and I wanted, I think maybe we should all like respond to this. I think it's very applicable, but like, um, I find myself getting very, very irritable at my husband all the time. And I don't know what to do. I feel like we're all fighting more. I don't know if it's because we're all stuck together or because we're all scared. Do you guys have any tips on how we can all get along as a family? Because I worry that as my kids are watching this, they're learning some bad behaviors. Yeah. Dan, you want to go first? <laughs> oh, well, you know, um, it's a challenging time. There's a lot we cannot control right now. And when we get comfortable with what we do not control, we have an easier time managing the strong feelings of others around us. Things are going to be fine. They're not right now, but we don't have a lot of control. But everything is going to be okay. We get comfortable with what we can control. Focus on the good things to come. Many wonderful good things are in store for all of us. Life will get back to normal. That's great. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember that and to have some optimism about it. What about you, Donna? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, literally last night, I, I definitely think it's important to have optimism, but literally last night, I needed to just be away from the three of them, the two boys. <laughs> And so I started, I, I actually sent them out on the walk to do the walk. I didn't join them that, that time. So I said, I just really want to be able to cook by myself and listen to some podcasts. So they went and then they returned so quickly. And so when they came in, I said, you guys, that was, that was fast. I said, <laughs> I'm still trying to kind of have my time. Do you guys mind going out into the backyards? Can I, 
you have 15 more minutes. So I just asked for it. I hadn't yeah. done that and they were okay with it. I mean, at first, you know, my husband kind of looked at me and I said, no, I actually really need this right now. Yeah. And he said, okay. And I Not said, I'll return, rude, the right? I'll return the favor. But yeah, cause it's hard. Yeah. But yeah. again, gratitude, look, the situation we're in, a lot of people are in different situations. And so if you look at what you can be grateful for, I think that that helps. Yeah, I think gratitude's great. Optimism is great. And, and being okay with the fact that sometimes you need a little separation and asking for it and good communication obviously is important. Um, I'm lucky that I have my office, like my home office and actually it faces the door. So like I have sunlight and everything else. But actually, I have a little sign outside my door, especially if I'm in the middle of a meeting or something. It's like a little whiteboard and I write on the side what I'm doing so, so my husband doesn't come in in case he's home at the same time. So right now the sign says Facebook Live in progress because <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't want to walk into frame. But, you know, I haven't utilized it for just like writing like I need some space, like need an hour by myself, you know? I don't think that that's so wrong. I mean, I, I feel like people are just like, like, oh, that's gonna hurt someone's feelings, but I think you're gonna hurt their feelings more if you're irritable and then you interact with them and then you say something you don't mean, right? So I think we should just all like be creative about like finding some time for ourselves. I think that's totally important. I'm exercising every single day. One, cause there's like no excuse not to, I guess, cause you're just home all day. But two, like if I didn't, I think I would definitely go crazy. Like it's definitely my main coping strategy. So I run on my treadmill every day and like it really, it really, really helps. Um, sometimes I feel like a, a lot of this is <laughs> somebody, when Wendy's watching our feed and she says, ha ha, they returned so quickly. Yeah, it's like, you're like, oh, you're only gone for like 15 minutes there. They're like, no, we've been gone an hour. You're like, are you sure? Um, I think our perception of time is definitely different, you know. Um, I, I am lucky because my, my husband is on the front lines. He's working in the hospital right now. And so actually I have hours um, of time to myself during the day. So I think, I think my perspective is skewed. Um, but with people who do live together and work together, I know some people who have been putting up partitions, like, um, like if they're sharing the living room, but they have like one of those room dividers and, you know. They create, they do what they can to get their own space when, when not everybody can go out at the same time, you know? So. And I wanted to provide everybody here with um, some of Dr. Franklin's information. Dr. Franklin is, you know, he is so um, humble that he doesn't even talk about all of his amazing achievements, but he's an author, he's an entrepreneur, um, he owns Franklin Ed. So you guys should check him out at franklined.com, F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N, that's his last name ed.com and check out all the amazing things that he's up to. Um, but Donna, your podcast, I'm so excited for uh, your new episodes to feature some teenagers. Like what do they really think about everything? You know, <laughs> I love that. We're just like conjecturing, you know, but really they're going to tell us what's up. <laughs> awesome guys. Well, thank you so much and have an amazing afternoon and evening. And we're going to talk soon. We'll do this again. Great. See ya. Bye. See you Bye. later.